So this is exciting to be with you. I, I tried to think about uh, what would be some of the most helpful teaching tips is, you know, I, I even talked to the other coordinators here and I said, what, what makes it, what are some things that make, like you walk away thinking today was a good day, you know? <laughs> and by the way, I want to let you know that everybody, everybody walks away with bad days. Okay. Those are, those are some, there are bad days in seminary. It happens. Sometimes either we're not on, the students aren't on, things happen. But there are some tips that can really help. Now, when I say four tips too, I just got to be real with you guys. There are a million things we could do, right, that could help our seminary experience. But I tried to think what would be some of the most helpful tips that would help with, with teaching. And so we want you to really love your calling. And uh, there are some things that, that can help with that. So I'm going to give them to you right off the bat here, and then we're going to go through each of them. Um, and I'd be fine to even jump where you guys want to go and spend time where you'd like to go. So first off is to cultivate a climate of love, respect, and of purpose. Why is this going to be helpful in your opinion? Why is, in what way do you feel that these three things can dramatically change your seminary class experience? What happens if we don't, let's start with the first one. What happens in a room where there's not a feeling of love? Yeah. Uh, what's going to be a sign of that then? What might be a sign of that? They're not there, right? They're, they're not wanting to come. So this is something you need to develop right off the bat the first day of seminary. Heidi, do you have anything else to? Exactly. There's contention between certain groups in your class. I don't know how to fix that, but I know I know classes last year that had that with some of the students. So I don't know how to help my teachers fix that kind of situation. Yeah, no problem, because, you know, any situation, as long as you can identify it, if you can identify, I have students not getting along with each other, call your coordinator, call your coordinator, we will help you and find ways to solve and manage. In fact, please know we will come to your classrooms, we'll come watch, we'll see what's going on, and we'll discuss with you, we are your teammates, okay, we are your teammates. Also, the other teachers in your building are your teammates, and uh, we all want to help each other succeed. That's what, that's what the point of all this is. You have teammates, so please know that. Let's go to the next one. Um, why, what, what happens if you don't have respect in the classroom, or what are some indicators if you do not have respect? Cell phones, getting homework, coffee. Yep. Even showing up late to class, right? It could be, could be part of that as well. Um, yeah. Yes. It's not just like the students showing respect to the teacher, and yes, that the indication that could be when the teacher maybe is making like sarcastic comments towards the students yeah. and expecting them to like setting really the bar and acting like, oh, of course you're going to do this and that or whatever. And so kind of like both ways, respect, you know, from the teacher to the students and respect to the students. Wonderfully taught. Wonderfully taught. It, it's so correct. And as teachers, if we come out with our authoritarian you're going to do what I say, and if you're not here and you have that kind of attitude, they can feel it. They, they know when you don't like them. They, they can sense it. Um, and I would encourage you to pray and do whatever you can to, to love them and call their parents and get to know them better. And, um, but yes, respect goes both ways, absolutely. She's talking about me, actually. Uh, she said, like, I'm like, 
And it's really important not to call kids out in front of their peers. Correct. And this idea of calling kids out, it's very hard to call them back in. Yes. So if you call them out and embarrass them or, you know, really shame them in some way in front of others, very, very difficult to get them to, to be back in um, and, and then that respect them. It's very you're you're exactly right if you offend them it's going to take double the work to get them back yeah after after that has done been done yeah very well said thank you the last one here by the way we're going to go over these a little bit later too but what is purpose how do you know if you don't have purpose in your classroom what would be an indicator of that perhaps John, uh, or, Jacob. Jacob, sorry, Jacob, my bad. Probably not much of a scripture based conversation. Yes. That's exactly right. That, and you know, it's difficult as an early morning teacher because your tendency is students are going to show up late and then what you're going to think is okay is just to start late too and you're going to drag that time back and you're like well i can't start without students right but what starts to ha happen is they see why am i even here on time my teacher never starts on time uh, why should i even be there on time right uh i when i was the first student teacher the first student teacher i observed just sat up on the desk and just shot the breeze with them for about 15 minutes. Didn't even get into the lesson for 15 minutes. And uh, I remember as a seminary student, my teacher used to talk about football all the time. Now, as a guy, and I like football, but you know what? I wasn't there for football. I was there to learn. I was in the middle of going through a troublesome time where there was peer pressure in school where I felt there was bullying, where there are all these different things. And I needed a spiritual experience in my classroom. And so as a teacher, it is okay to take time to get to know and have fun, but, but purpose students can see if you know, if you, they can see if you love the scriptures, if you love the scriptures and if you love them, you're going to get into them and you're going to have a fun time and they can see that fire within you. And so if you, if, if your class, you know, if, if you feel, and part of this also, this purpose is that you have a purpose as a teacher and that your students have a purpose, that you expect them to fulfill a role in the class. You expect them, you have high expectations for them. If you never call a kid out for being tardy, you're just allowing that behavior to happen, right? If you never, and but when, when I say call a kid out, I'm not, yeah. Right. We're not we're not being rude. Right. But what you're doing is you're figuring out, hey, I, I really missed you this morning. Is there anything I can do to help you get here on time? And then listen to their response. Right. What happened? And then listen. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry that happened. I'll, maybe we can talk to your brother or sister to get up earlier so you can get here on time. You know, we, we love having you here, you know, but whatever you can do. And so help them remind them of their purpose. Uh, sometimes I do this through positive measures. I used to have a student pass out treats to whoever had their journal scriptures and was on time, right? That's just enforcing the good behavior that you have a purpose here. You should be ready. You should be ready for class today. The second teaching tip, stay relevant. What happens when you just talk about ancient scripture and stay in ancient scripture the whole time with 2022 teenagers. Yep. They are going to be bored. They are going to be on their phones. They are not going to enjoy that experience at all. So the next is engage the students. The old teaching models that we used to have long ago where where teachers stand and deliver a message. That is not an effective style of teaching. We need to get them engaged and see that they are valuable in our classrooms. And the last is to get deep. So this is the four tips that I'm gonna be going over today. We do not want surface level teaching. We need to get deep. So let's start off with this. 
as a general statement, we're starting a brand new year. How do you cultivate an environment of love, respect, and purpose in your classrooms? I'd like to hear from some of the things that you plan on doing or have done in the past. How do you establish these things right off the bat in your school years? Anything that you've done? Sister Marshall. I only have one kid at home now, so I have a little more time on my hands, but I like to try to go to some of their sports events or their things that they are involved in, choir performances, show, you know, trying to, to work on my relationship with them, to let them know that what they do is important, that I want to support them, and it helps me get to know them, and I feel like it really helps them in our relationship. It does, and you love them. You're going to, you're going to be friends with them throughout your whole life, you know, with, with that, and, and, uh, I love, I, I have old students of mine and you see them get married and go throughout life and you're still friends with them the whole time. And, and it's a wonderful thing because you develop that relationship. I used to worry, how, how do I have time to do this with kids and other things? I just brought my kids to those events with me and they got to go see a tennis match or something. It was fun. And then your kids get excited. Hey, I want to do that later in life, maybe, you know? And so, yeah, that, that's a great thing. Thank you. Any Any other suggestions, things that you're planning on doing or you feel are going to be effective in helping establish these. Yeah. If it, if it involves, um, one thing that I did is I tried to have, I tried to make birthdays, you know, number of birthdays. Good. Make people special. I have parents. But I think people just appreciate those thoughtful things. You know, it's, I, I thought one of the other things I thought was so much was how to be when you're Yes. Yes. Thank you. Those are excellent. By the way, with birthdays, did you know that Wise actually has a birthday list on there you can print out right from there? And if you have a hard time with that, reach out to the administrative assistant and they can get that list for you for your class. So yeah, you don't need to go through all the work, you guys. We can help you with all these things. If, if you're looking for something, reach out to us. We'll, we'll help you with that. Okay, do you have something to take notes with? Hopefully. I'm gonna show you an example of Sister Egan's class. You guys have probably, maybe some of you have probably seen this, but it's a good reminder. This teacher is going to do, I'm going to show you a model of, uh, of a teacher in a classroom. It's only about two and a half minutes long. I'd like you to tell me what actions or behaviors in this classroom showed that she understood the, these principles of um, creating this environment of love, respect, and purpose. Robbie, oh, yes, good uh, to see you. First man here. Hey, great. Hey, how, are you, hey, how are you doing, Amber? You I'm look good. like you're feeling better. I'm feeling so much better. Oh, great. I'm so glad I could be here. Great. Hi, Sister Egan. Hey, Ash, how are you doing? Hi. You're awake, but you're here. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> hey, trying. listen, you're conducting. Oh. We get that board going, okay? So Tennis so nice match to today. Uh, what time? Uh -huh. 3.30. Oh, great. Okay, I'm going to be there 3.30. Yeah. Court oh, side. Nervous. Okay, we're playing double. So <laughs> we can okay. make it through the day. <laughs> You'll get it. You'll get it. Great. Hi, hey, how you doing? Good, Good to see you today. Great. Hey, John, I missed you yesterday. Was it sick? Yeah. Sickness? Okay. Good. We can't do it without you, brother. Hey, hey Emil, how you doing? Hey, sister, how's it going? Great. Hey, I noticed Jason is not with you. Did he catch a ride with you today? No, I came to his house, but he never answered. Oh, so. man, not good news. Okay. Honk really loud tomorrow, will you? Right. We've got to get him here. Okay, thanks. Cam? <laughs> Time for seminary. Welcome to seminary. Um, today we have a big tennis match. Yeah, excited. Yeah. It's nice to have Amber back from being sick. Today we're going to be singing hymn number 98. I need thee every hour. Lindsay playing the piano for us. Robbie, you're going to um, conduct the music. Uh, read. Then you'll say the prayer. And then Ashley got the devotional. Okay, what 
did she do? What do you see? She greeted them one by one. Yes, greeted them one by one. I even do that if they show up late. I say, oh, Robbie, so great to see you. Thanks for being here today. You know, doesn't matter if they're late. We're happy that they're there, right? We, you make them feel special. Um, if you're if you're not uh, if you're worried about handshakes, what are some other ways? Fist bumps, high fives, air stuff, right? Just with that smile on your face. What else did you see? What else did she do? So I, by the way, I always go to the door right before they leave, and I always am there right as they enter. So if you're up doing your lesson prep, you're you're gonna miss them coming in. If you're uh, if you're not there as they're leaving, you know, just that final reminder. I especially like to pull students aside. I felt prompted to talk to during class. That's a great way to say, hey, can you just stay after for a second too? I'd like, and then say bye to everyone and then talk to that student, you know. Um, careful though, you don't want to be one-on-one -on -one without other people. So try to be um, in an open public area. But great. Any other things that you guys saw? What did you see? When she greeted, she greeted them personally with what the tennis. So you always said survive the back. Yes, she knew what was going on, right, with them. Yes, very good. Anything else? She turned her class over to the students. She trusted them. She's handling. Yes, we trust the students. And she has the vision for that, right? She was in the back of the classroom and they were leading, right? They have a purpose. Your purpose isn't just to sit there the whole time. You're leading. Yeah, you guys need to be up here. You need to be doing stuff. And they knew it. They, they were prepared. They knew that that was their job. It wasn't like she was all on the spur of the moment. They already knew that they were the leader of the team or whatever. Yeah. And by the way, first aid, this is how you plan all this stuff. Did I ever have the students start first aid? No, because I have to train them, right? But your, your first couple of weeks, it's training. This is training your students to fulfill their role and know their role, right? So that they're ready for these things. You're going to have to take five minutes out of your lesson to get a devotional set up. You're going to have to take five minutes out of your devotional to maybe get, okay, who's going to be, maybe you want to, you know, have people lead the devotionals a certain day, right? Whatever that might be. So yeah, that it's worth the time, five minutes of your class to do that every once in a while. Anything else you saw? That you wanted to, to share. Okay, so this is just an example, but obviously this teacher has paid a price. I used to, the first week, my major goal was to get to know their names. First off, it's so hard to teach when you don't even know people's names. So first thing, first day, I usually had them, uh, I just gave them a half piece of paper, had them pull it in half, and put the little name in front of the class, just in front of their seat. And then that helped me um, I would take pictures of the kids. They hated that sometimes, but you know, it, it helped me to scroll through at home and study um, the kids' names. I had like 160 back then, so that was needed. Maybe you don't need to take the time with, you know, if it's if it's uh, fewer, but for me, it was helpful to do that as well with their permission. So these are some of those things that, that you want to do. Okay, let's see. We're going to move on to the next thing, I think, here. Let's start with keeping this discussions relevant. Um, how do you make scripture relevant? In fact, just these past weeks, we've been talking about Esther, Job, we're jumping into Psalms. How do you bring such ancient scripture and make it relevant in your classrooms? How do you make things, these things relevant to the students? Any thoughts? I don't have a thought, but I have a comment. My daughter's 34, and she remembers her seminary teacher and still quotes him today because he made it relevant. So I know it's important. Thank you. Thank you. It is so important. Please. I think taking time to focus on the You know, like questions that spark discussion. Uh, questions that are fun and, and thought provoking that are from, you know, and tying those into what you're learning because I think that's, that's such a, to me, that's what I think of when I think of making the scripture relevant. 
Yes. Yeah. Very, very good. Thought out questions. And a question I always ask myself when teaching students is this. The problem is you have bias. You're looking at it from the perspective of a mother as an, you know, who has been through your life experiences. So what I do is I always think, what would a teenager in 2020 at this high school in Hanford or Modesto or whatever, what do they need to know from this lesson? And how does this relate to that? When you take the time to just think that way, the Holy Ghost, and you know what's even better than that? When you use it by name. What does Bill in my class need to know from this? What does Sam need to know? That is when the Holy Ghost will invite you to do certain things and to focus on certain parts of the lesson more than others because it's directed at what your students need. And that's that's a powerful and effective method. Did you have a comment? You said it much better than me. Your idea is better than me. I was just going to break that down. If you think of Esther or Joe, I was thinking one way would be to switch places with them. And maybe instead of Esther trying to convince the king not to kill her people, we could substitute Esther for a student and come up with a different scenario where they have to be super brave in a scary situation. I mean, that might make things go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just think about that. Jacob, sorry. Um, yeah, I would, I would imagine but trying to remember how you were at that, that age, like whatever age you're with it. So I'm, I'm teaching juniors. Like my junior year was an important year for me. So like that was one that's like, okay, what are the, the overall like things in their life are generally the same. They're going out of, out of, out of a different way of social media, and I didn't really have, but in general, their relationships, their friends, their their own spirituality and testimony they're trying to build. Like those are all they're all the same. They're all learning how to drive the same. So like having leaning on back onto those and, and how you had like what you thought felt what you kind of thought, oh, I wish you had told me about this might be a beneficial activity and bring it bring that scripture into more modern age of how you're seeing this. Exactly. When, yeah, when have you been in a moment of pressure, right, in your life? What are they pressured by? Think about what kids are pressured by, like Esther was, right? Think about, think about, yeah, it, it, you're right. They're all facing very similar things. Self-image, their, you know, sports, art, finding what's, you know, it, 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 once you get a grasp of what they're going through and even ask the students, what are you guys dealing with today? You don't have to come up with everything. You know, you, you might just say that, you know, you guys might not ever meet a Mordecai. You not, might not be before an actual king someday. But what are moments of pressure where you're invited to either stand for God or not, you know, and then have them answer for themselves? Or if they don't want to talk about them, the a good teaching tactic is to get them to think about other students. They're always it's always easier to talk about someone else as a student, right, because then it's not on you. So what are students your age facing at the school today that are pressuresome moments, right? And then that's going to spark something, right? And if they're not talking, use other methods. Get them right on Post-it notes. Have your students write down on Post-it notes. Go write it up on the board. Go put, put, put them up on the board. Read through a bunch of them, you know? That way, their voices are being heard, but just in another way. So um, I'd like to, there is power in relevance. And this might not happen all the time, but I want to share with you my colleague's experience. My colleague, uh, one of my favorite colleagues I've ever worked with, uh, was back in Kearns, Utah. And this was a um, young African-American kid who he uh, battled a lot of and faced a lot of pressure in his life coming from all different directions. He, he just did a podcast. And on this podcast, he shared one of the biggest moments in his life when he felt that he wanted to, when he felt God reaching out to him. And, and I want you to think about how relevance really impacted this portion of his life. So I'm just going to share this. Let's see right here. 
I'm going to play this. Started to really change. And so I'm on this football team at Dixie State, and I'm once again trying to maneuver through life. I'm seeing all these different lifestyles in the locker room, and I just I felt like angels were starting to be placed in my life. You know, I, I met a really good friend, Jen's Bundle, and I really believe, like, God had – put us together because Jen's, you know, we're going through football camp and he's talking about how excited he is to go on a mission. And I'm like, this kid is so annoying. Like, this is weird. <laughs> but it, he just grew on me. And we had finished Hell Week and I was just dog tired. And there was a fireside that night and he's like, we should all go. And I was like, I am not going to that fireside, Jen's. Like, I'm tired. I'm not going. And, but he showed up at my house and he just banged on the door until I came out. So I went out and that fireside, this man had been speaking, you know, he's speaking to us. I had my head down, I'm, you know, I'm pretending like I don't listen. I'm not listening. Kind of like I did my whole life in church. Right. Like, head down, I'm not listening. But that day I was listening and this guy started, he's like, I need to tell you guys about the biggest decision I ever had to make in my life. And, you know, so my head's down and I'm listening to him say that. And then he said, it was my decision between a mission and football. And I, my head shot up. I was like, I got to hear what he chose. You know, he's like, I had a D1 scholarship and, you know, and uh, he ended up talking about how he chose to serve a mission and how that blessed his life way longer than football did. And that was like a, a moment where I could really identify like God is talking to me. Like there's about 300, 400 kids at that fireside, but it felt like that man was talking right to me. Did you notice the relevance? He could have showed up and that person could have talked about whatever, but he tried to focus on their life, their age, what they're going through. And because he did that, he changed a life that day. That was a very monumental part of Kyler's uh, repentance process was having a rel the, the speaker relevantly talking about something that they were facing in their life that day. So um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts or anything about relevance that you'd like to share? Okay. All right. Back a couple of years ago, it was Elder Holland who gave a talk. And as part of his talk, he, he shared something that I've always remembered. Um, let me try to share this on Zoom so they can see it as well. Okay, so he said, remember that a student is not a container to be filled, but a student is a fire to be ignited. What is Elder Holland? How would you uh, say what he's saying in, in other words? Tammy? I remember that. I heard that, and I got so nervous because I was like, I don't know. I have absolutely no clue how to do that. I've gotten a little better, but you know, that was several years ago. But still, at the time, it was kind of overwhelming. I thought, "Oh my goodness, I really need to talk about that." So, Tammy, you you said that you have had a few years since you've heard this. <laughs> what um, what kind of teaching? First of all, do you well, let me come back to your experience in just a second. But for all of you. What does it look like when you're trying to fill a container? And what's your teaching style probably going to be like? Information. Lecture, information. All I need to do is make sure you know what this left. Couldn't they just really just read it on their own? Do we really need teachers? Could, couldn't we have, in fact, couldn't the church get one of the best teachers of all time and just do a podcast where the students log in and just listen to information? But why don't we do that? Because that's not what they need. That is not effective teaching. So, Tammy, what did you learn? Just a few things over these past years about that. What did you change? I was excited about something. I shared that. Excited. This is what I learned. This is what the Spirit told me. And kind of just... Help and get them in, you know, enthusiastic about 
help to engage them and help them think and you know good questions that kind of thing. Love it. Questions are critical for this because it gets them to want to open their mouth, right? If you're if you never ask a question, they never have a chance to speak. They do full start to say something, and really what they're doing is bearing their testimony as a principle, but they don't realize that yes. they're not saying, I don't my testimony yeah, yeah. <laughs> about this principle. They're just sharing their own experience or sharing something that they've learned through experience. And so then you've got that kid's testimony of that principle solidifying, right? But then they're also sharing it with their peers. So it's helping solidify that principle in their peers minds and hearts and it's just a really beautiful thing like we know as teachers the reason we get so much out of, of the principles and the things that we're teaching is because we get a chance to testify in principle so we want to make sure that our students get that same opportunity to testify in principle even though they would never recognize them i love it i love you know i'm not i wasn't ready for i wonder if i should show this video I think I'm going to do it because of what you just shared. Um, I'm going to do it. Oops. Okay. I'm going to have to get out of this for just a second. Let me go to my videos. It's really beautiful message. If I can find it. Let me search if I can't find it right now. Um, For the right while you're looking? Yes. As well as asking other questions, I found that when you don't see the answer, when you let them discover the answer in scripture or something. I call them aha moments or their wow moments. You know, like, oh, that's what the answer is. And I'm just sitting there going, wasn't me. You guys, you guys figured it out. And I think they find confidence in them. You are exactly right. That is exactly what we need to do in teaching. We should not lead them through our process, but allow them to come up with these things on their own. Um, I'm just gonna try that. If it doesn't work right here, then I'm done. Uh, I won't worry about it. Okay, here it is. Okay, let me just share this with Zoom. All right. As I observe the clock, I fold my notes that I have prepared and place them in my inside pocket. But let me take just a moment to mention a little story that made an impression upon me when I was a boy. This came to my mind today when it was mentioned that there are with us this afternoon a great group of dedicated people who teach our youth. It was on a summer day early in the morning. As a boy, I was standing near the window the curtains obstructed me from two little creatures out on the lawn. One was a large bird, and the other a little bird, obviously just out of the nest. I saw the larger bird hop out on the lawn, then thump his feet and cock his head. And he drew a big fat worm out of the lawn and came hopping back. The little bird opened its bill wide 
and the big bird swallowed the worm. <laughs> and then I saw the big bird fly up into the tree, and he picked at the bark for a little while, and then came back with a big bug in his mouth. The little bird opened its beak wide, and the big bird swallowed the bug. Now there was some squawking in protest, I noticed, but then the big bird flew away and I didn't see it again. But I watched the little bird. After a little while, the little bird hopped out on the lawn, thumped its feet, and cocked its head and pulled a big worm out of the lawn. God bless our people who teach our children and our youth. May the Lord bless them, I humbly pray in Jesus' name, amen. Bless you for all you do. The question is, how do we stop eating it in front of them all the time, right? How do we get them to, to do those things? And one of the best way is through questions. Questions and uh, engaging them. This kind of has to do with our next section, engaging the student. Or not engaging, going deep in our classes. So how do we teach students and not lessons? One typical failure we can have as teachers is when we think that we need to cover the material. And we may even say in our minds, oh, I love this so much. This is so awesome. I, I have to show this to them. And so then what we do is we rush from principle to principle and just eat the worm in front of the students. And we walk away and we filled a container and not ignited a fire. So in the old gospel teaching and learning handbook, there are certain levels of questions that we can ask, and I am not going to bring that up tonight, but just more than anything else to give you an idea that there are different levels or surfaces that we must get to, and the power is when we get students testifying and feeling the truth and importance of what we are learning in class. I have never, the best lessons that I've ever had or when my students are raising their hands and saying, Brother Wright, I had an experience like that. I had an experience that when I did this, I felt Jesus Christ help me. And every student in that room hears that message. Those are what the students need to hear. They don't need to hear all the information. They're going to get that on Sunday. They're going to get that in their home. They're going to get it some other time in life. But for today, to be buoyed up by other students and to feel power and testimony coming into the classroom. That is, that is our objective. And so if you can't cover everything, good. But that means that we're gonna have to choose and pick what we're gonna cover. And we're gonna have to prioritize that there are certain principles in today's lesson and doctrine that's gonna be more important for a teenager living in 2020 than others. And there might be certain students in your class that need a certain message, and that might drive you to go to a certain level. So we're gonna do a little practice session of this today. First of all, I'll teach you the four types of questions. These are four, there's tons of types of questions. There's not just four. But these are particularly important in teaching seminary. The first is 
questions that invite students to search for information. So you may start out this week, for example, I did this with my family. We went to Psalms 23 this week. And I had my, my, my family, including my kids, go through and I said, first, my first question is in verse one, in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I said, what is the, what is the Savior compared to in this? And they looked and they searched and they found shepherd. Well, that's a no brain thinking one, right? It's just look for it. But that doesn't really help us to go deep yet, does it? We don't want to stay there. Now we want to enter into deeper stages. So we want to go now to questions that would analyze for understanding. So my next question was, why do you think out of all the different titles that this psalmist felt that they would compare Jesus to a shepherd? What do shepherds do? I asked my kids. My little kids said, well, they feed, they help keep them safe. They keep them from danger. They take them to places where there's water and places where there's food. And they watch over them and they know them because we, my daughter especially loves animals. Okay, that's great. We're learning what a, what a shepherd is, but we really haven't gone deep enough, have we? So now we want to go to invite feelings and testimony. By the way, analyze for understanding. We're not quite done with that one yet. We would say, how is Jesus like a shepherd? Now the students in their minds are beginning to connect. Jesus Christ, how does he feed us? How does he watch over and protect us? How does he guide us? How does he do all those various words? And maybe we have up on our board all of those different things that Jesus Christ does. Now, we invite them to testify. What's a question that we could use? after we've established all this that would get them to testify. We have all those things that Jesus does up on the board. What's a question we can now ask perhaps? Excellent. Or maybe you leave it open and say, when has he done one of these things? Which one, when, when's the last time you felt the Lord do one of these things for you? And maybe this is such a good question. And maybe you know that the Holy Ghost is needed so much in this and that teenagers need at least 20 seconds to even process the question. that You're going to have them write in their journal for the next two minutes about that. I'd like you to pick one of these things that, that the Savior does. When, it, when is a time in your life when you have felt him doing these things? What's going to be happening during that time if they're paying attention and trying? What's going to happen, you think? The Spirit is going to witness to them and testify to them of a moment. And according, as John 14, 26 says, the, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And you as a teacher trust that the Spirit will bring that memory and they will feel the power of that memory. And they will connect on a deeper level with Jesus Christ that day because of what you've done. Then while they're writing, maybe you're walking around the room as they're writing in their journals and you see someone who has really written a lot and you whisper in their ear, Susie, would you be willing to share this? And she says, no. And so as a teacher, you walk to another student and you say, would you be willing to share this with the class? And they say, yes. And then once they're done, you say, after having invited, would you be willing to share what you said? And now that they've broken the ice, then you open up to the rest of the class. Anyone else that would like to share? And you have testimony from all of your students and you're deep. But we're not done yet. We don't want to just teach a lesson. It's all about conversion. 
And so we need to ask it questions that will invite them to act. We can't force agency upon students, but we can invite and we can encourage. What is perhaps a application question that you could ask from, from any of that? Anything that would invite them to act? Can anyone think of anything that perhaps in that scenario? Yeah, Jacob. Um, uh, was like, uh, you go throughout your day, I just want to encourage you to find moments in your day where probably are separate from our questions. No, that's great. You invited them to do something that day. That's great. Yeah, they may be thinking about it. And maybe you say tomorrow at the beginning of class, as a teacher, you write down that you asked that question, and we don't want to miss the follow up, right? So the next day you start with, did anyone have any moments yesterday where you felt the, the shepherding effect of Jesus Christ in your life? Or, yeah, it, it could be another question such as, um, I want you to, um, Jesus Christ is trying to feed you. He's trying to guide you. He's trying to give you direction and keep you. What is one thing in your life that you could do to better allow him to feed you? Maybe you're not allowing him to feed you. What is something you're going to do today that will better allow you to shepherd you in your life, right? Maybe that's the question you ask. Then the next day, you follow up. Because this is a critical part of seminary we always forget is that it's more important that they're changing and acting and repenting than just getting information. It's wonderful to hear testimony, but if they never act, then we're not getting them where they need. And that's to Jesus Christ. We want them turning to him. And we as teachers can invite and encourage that. And so I'd encourage you to do that. So we're almost done with this section. We have two minutes left. And I want to give you a, an opportunity to even think about this with maybe something else. Psalms 119, 105. As we study, this is, this is coming up in one of your first lessons you'll teach next week. Okay. Here's a principle. As we study the word of God, we can receive guidance for our lives. That's what we're hoping the students will discover from that. So it comes from this scripture. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the scripture. So could you think of perhaps a search question, an analyze question, an invite question, and an application question? Let's start with the first one. What is a search for question? By the way, that's the full verse. You don't even need to open it up. That's the full verse. What's an analyze? What's a search for question? Yeah. I love it. I love it. What's it? another one, right? Could be, what is the word? They might be like, what is that? Where do we find the word? Right? All those different things. Exactly. How about an analyze for understanding question? By the way, I, I do want to know, I do want you to know that you're not alone on all this. The teacher's manual actually do have questions like this, but it's good for you to identify which one they're having them do. Where is it leading a student to? Are they learning more about it? Are they understanding this better? Or is this an invitation? Typically, like, when is a time in your life that's more of an invite to uh, feel and testify, right? Um, if it's a question like, why would this happen? That's an understand. That's a deep in your, your interest. Um, what is this scripture teaching? That's kind of like, you know, something like this. So you can kind of go through all those things. Uh, what will you do? Those are going to be your encourage application questions. So in all of this, um, one of the most powerful things, as we kind of summarize this and go all together once again, if you want, if you're having problematic behaviors, if you're having disruptions with students, maybe you need to work on cultivating your environment of love, respect, and purpose a little bit more. If your students are bored, maybe you want to look at relevance a little bit more, maybe add some variety to your teaching. Um, and maybe you're not engaging the students. 
Maybe you want to look at how much time am I spending talking versus my students. Um, and depth, when you walk away from the class, did any of your students testify of anything that day? Or did you even get to a level where that could happen? So I hope this was helpful and beneficial. These are just four tips, of course, but I hope that uh, these are this has been helpful and, a, and will be a blessing to you. I, uh, I testify that the Savior is with you. He will help and guide you through this. He loves all of your students. And if you will lean upon him, he will help you um, to love them as he does and to teach them as he would. I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.